Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. I'm Laura, this is Culturally Nonsense, or I guess welcome back if you're a returning viewer. Thank you so much. And also thanks to everyone who subscribed and recently pushed me over a thousand subscribers. It means a lot and it's great that all of you are watching my videos. Anyway, today, again, we're doing something a little different from my usual videos on the Elizabeth Holmes trial. We are going to dive into the satanic panic, which is actually something a viewer asked me to talk about maybe two months ago now, and I just kind of got around to it. It was a little bit difficult because there were a bunch of different topics, so today is just going to be a little bit of an introduction, and I'm actually planning to make a couple of videos later on. So anyway, what is the satanic panic. Uh, I've got a lot of quotes today, so let's get into some of this. One of the most famous prolonged mass media scares in history, the satanic panic was characterized at its peak by fearful media depictions of godless teenagers and the deviant music and media they consumed. This in turn led to a number of high profile criminal cases that were heavily influenced by all the social hysteria. Most people associate the satanic panic with so-called satanic ritual abuse, a rash of false allegations made against daycare centers in the 80s, and with the case of the West Memphis Three in the 90s, in which three teenagers whose wrongful conviction on homicide charges was based on little more than suspicion over their goth lifestyles. At their core, satanic ritual abuse claims relied on overzealous law enforcement, unsubstantiated statements from children, and above all, coercive and suggestive interrogation by therapists and prosecutors. Some of the defendants are still serving life sentences for crimes they probably didn't commit, and which likely didn't happen in the first place. As for the West Memphis Three, they were eventually released in 2011 after spending 18 years in prison, and their case stands as one of the worst examples of what happens when police rush to judgment without evidence in a case. So what were some things that led to all of this mass hysteria? We can't really point to one thing that led to the satanic panic. However, increased media coverage, different social trends, and a confluence of events kind of led to this decade or era as a whole. Leading into this, we can go all the way back to the late 60s and the Manson family. Charles Manson's kind of cult operation in the late 1960s culminated in a string of murders in the summer of 1969 that shocked the nation and put organized ritualistic killing on the brain. That same year, organist-turned-occultist Anton LaVey published his philosophical treatise, The Satanic Bible, which plagiarized several sources and mostly regurgitated earlier philosophies of self-actualization and self-empowerment from writers like H.L. Macon and Ayn Rand. Uh, Ayn Rand specifically is very popular in conservative circles as well, so the Satanic Bible wasn't really something that's connected with all of this ritual abuse. It was more about philosophy more than anything else. It obviously just had the title Satanic Bible, which freaked people out. <laughs> Nevertheless, it became the seminal work of modern Satanism and the key text for the Church of Satan, a group that LaVey had officially founded back in 1966. Shortly after this, in the 1970s, 1971, we had the book The Exorcist, which was turned into a movie in 1973, and this actually led to thousands and thousands of people requesting exorcisms, which was a service that the Catholic Church kind of rarely even offered up until that point. The exorcist profoundly impacted America's collective psyche regarding the existence of demons, and single-handedly transformed the popular Ouija board from a fun, harmless parlor game into a malevolent device capable of inducing spirit possession, demonic infestation, or other paranormal activity. This is just one example of how popular media can really get into people's minds and change the way that we think about a certain subject. In 1972, there was the publication of The Satan Seller. This was an ultimately discredited, pretty heavily fabricated memoir. It was written by self-proclaimed Christian evangelist Mike Warnke. Uh, the Satan Seller recounted a childhood and young adulthood that Warnke claimed were spent in intense satanic worship. Warnke wrote that he served as a satanic high priest and was engaged in, among other things, ritualistic sex orgies. If you would like to know more about that, uh, I will link in the description below a couple podcast episodes of the show You're Wrong About. And in these, I think at least three episodes, they go into the book really just chronologically through it and read a bunch of passages, dive into things, do a bit more explaining with the further context, and I found that to be really interesting. 
Also in 1972, Anton LaVey, the Church of Satan guy, published another work, The Satanic Rituals, which also reinforced the idea that dark occult rituals had become a routine part of life for many Americans. The 1970s also saw the rise of many self-proclaimed ex-Satanists who talked about how, you know, the world in America specifically was being controlled by these shady groups. John Todd, Herschel Smith, and David Hansen were among these. Uh, and including Warren Key, all four of these men grew up in Southern California. And this is a really great quote here. Uh, they seemed to emerge from the still smoldering ashes of the Manson cults to declare that the world was full of dark occult symbols and far-reaching satanic conspiracies. All of them claimed to have conversion experiences that made their stories appealing to Christians. All of them were linked to the emerging fundamentalist Christian right, which really had an upswing in this era as well. So. Uh, I don't necessarily know how these two things are connected, but it seems like they may be fed off of each other with the fear of dark and occult things bolstering more Christian belief. And more Christian belief sounding the alarm about these supposed dark, occult, scary things. Warren Key, for example, spent over a decade posing as an expert in Satanism for the fundamental evangelical Christian community, passing off much of his made-up childhood as a template for how real Satanism worked. After the conviction of the Manson family in the early 1970s, this decade also saw a slew of other serial killers. Um, for example, even though the Zodiac Killer operated in 68 and 69, you know, he was never caught. So he uh, was kind of a specter over the whole area as well. But in addition to him, you had the Alphabet Killer, Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, the Hillside Strangler, David Berkowitz, aka Son of Sam. Even the Golden State Killer was active during this time in the 1970s, and we also had the Jonestown Massacre in 1978. In short, the 1970s scared the shit out of people. It was like the golden age of serial killers. I don't mean to glamorize this time, but just pointing out the sheer number of cases and all of the media coverage surrounding them had a huge impact on the American psyche. Jonathan Mahler, author of Ladies and Gentlemen, The Bronx is Burning, wrote about the impact that Son of Sam had on the media. The frenzied coverage fanned the growing sense of fear, and the growing sense of fear fanned the frenzied coverage. Mahler's observation about the media feeling this mass panic would ring true well into the next decade, when heightened religious fears and the concept of stranger danger coalesced into a new breed of mass hysteria. I think it's more than plausible to connect the dots between all of these terrible occurrences and people thinking Satan and demons were actively at work. In a way, that can kind of be more comforting than thinking people were just doing things of their own volition. Peter Bebergall, author of Season of the Witch, How the Occult Saved Rock and Roll, said that believing that Satan is running the world is still offering a kind of order to things in a world that can feel very disorderly. And another quote here about this time, Although the Reagan era was a time of economic growth and financial prosperity, it was also a time of unease centered on population growth, urbanization, and the rise of the double income family model, which necessitated a sharp increase in the need for daycare services. As a result, anxiety about protecting the nuclear family from the unknown dangers of this new era was high. The 80s saw the spread of AIDS misinformation, kidnapped victims, faces appearing on milk cartons, the mass panic surrounding the 1982 Tylenol murders, trick-or-treat scares, and the first wave of reports of scary clown killers attempting to prey on children. Each of these moments of social unrest signaled Americans' alarms and growing fears over stranger danger and made them feel that evil could be lurking around any corner. And as I mentioned before, Christian fundamentalism and the literal belief of angels and demons interacting in our lives was on the rise. Anti-occult crusaders like Pat Pulling, who believed her son's death by suicide was the result of a Dungeons and Dragons curse, crusaded against role-playing games as dangerous and demonic, backed by occult fear-mongering from Chick and his Chick Tracks. He was another Christian evangelist who wrote these kind of pamphlets or comic books that often had messages about all of this Saint Hit satanic stuff. <laughs> Some people place a concrete beginning of the satanic panic to 1980 and the publication of Michelle Remembers. Uh, what I actually find really interesting about this is that Michelle Smith, the kind of protagonist of this book, was actually Canadian. So we think about the satanic panic as something very centered in America, but 
There were many cases of abuse in Canada as well that also gained extreme media coverage. Michelle Remembers was the biographical account of the repressed memories of the childhood ritual abuse purportedly suffered by Canadian psychiatric patient Michelle Smith. Written by Smith and her psychiatrist Lawrence Pazder, whom she later married, Michelle Remembers detailed the abuse that Smith alleged she experienced at the hands of her mother and other members of a satanic cult during the mid-1950s in her native British Columbia. Pazder, who was originally treating Smith for depression following a miscarriage, helped Smith surface these memories by means of regression hypnosis, a highly controversial psychotherapeutic technique whose validity has been widely called into question by members of the mental health community. I again want to mention you're wrong about at this point because they had five episodes breaking down Michelle Remembers, talking about a bunch of scenes from the book and also more context and background into Michelle and her psychiatrist Pazder's life. Throughout this book, it's pretty clear that he doesn't really follow best practices for a psychiatrist and he gets way too close to Michelle, which probably foreshadows how they both divorced their spouses and married each other later on. And talking about that regression memory hypnotherapy, there are many, many instances where in the writing of the book, you can see that he is suggesting something. And in these states, people are very likely to believe that they have a memory that they repressed when really it was probably implanted by their psychiatrist. The human brain isn't really like a filing cabinet where our memories are stored. Every time you remember something, you're kind of actively rewriting it. And it's really, really easy for someone to suggest something to you in a hypnotic state and believe that you, you know, pulled this memory out of regression when really your brain is just kind of coming up with it for the first time. And further, Michelle actually went to him for treatment because she was really traumatized about her miscarriage. And I believe that there are a lot of connections with the type of scenes and memories that she first started to describe to him that you could look at as being representations for her feelings around this miscarriage rather than actual, you know, satanic abuse. If you talk about, you know, the sacrificing of a baby, that could kind of relate to the guilt and shame that she felt over losing her child. A lot of women suffer feelings like that after a miscarriage, you know, thinking, could there have been something that I could have done to make this not happen? There's so many feelings wrapped up in her miscarriage, and it's clear that she was very traumatized by that. And I think some of that trauma was kind of passed off into this satanic abuse, which never happened. <laughs> I mean, even just one example, she claimed at one point that she was held under captivity when we have school records from the time that show she was at school every single day. I think at one point there was this, she talked about being run off the road in a car crash or something that never happened. There were no hospital reports, uh, just things that are clearly fantastical and could never have happened. Now, what's important to talk about this is that the satanic ritual abuse of children, I think at this time was kind of conflated with actual child abuse, which was really just starting to be talked about and prosecuted. In the years that followed the publication of Michelle Remembers, people all over the country began to come forward with stories of their own latent memories of childhood abuse at the hands of satanic cultists or allegations of pedophilia and devil worship against members of their own communities. Law enforcement agencies nationwide began holding seminars intended to help officers recognize the signs of satanic ritual abuse. The now famous Pazder, who had become a leading authority on the matter, attended hundreds of such seminars throughout the 1980s. And instead of just accepting the fact that sometimes people do these terrible things for no other reason besides they want to or they have a sickness, sometimes it's easier to think of it as being caused by Satan or demons. In the vast majority of reported cases of satanic ritual abuse, it was the testimony of the allegedly abused children themselves that damned dozens of innocent people to lengthy prison sentences and a lifetime of social exile. However, subsequent review of these cases revealed that much of this testimony was obtained through coercion and suggestive interviewing techniques by overzealous social workers, and that these statements were rarely questioned by investigating officers. Despite the utter lack of evidence to corroborate claims of satanic cult activity, new cases continued to be reported and believed nationwide, 
yet officials were no closer to uncovering any vast organized conspiracy by intergenerational satanic cults. Thanks to widespread and credulous media attention, Pazder and Smith, the authors of Michelle Our Members, were able to double down on their story, and Pazder became seen as an expert in the area of what would come to be called Satanic Ritual Abuse, or SRA. Despite the wildly implausible and unverified foundation of its stories of grisly abuse and sex orgies, Michelle Our Members was presented as a textbook during the 1980s and early 1990s for legal professionals and other authorities. It also spawned numerous copycat memoirs like 1988's Satan Underground, which was also shown to be false and which embellished and mainstreamed the idea of a massive intergenerational clandestine cult founded on satanic ritual abuse, one that could be occurring in your very own neighborhood. At the time, devil worshippers could be anywhere. They could be your next door neighbor. They could be your child's caregiver. And these stories freaked people out. The false narrative of Michelle Remembers would directly impact the nation for over a decade. Its dark occult fantasies helped to spark the rash of wildly dramatic, highly unfounded accusations of satanic ritual abuse that were attached to a string of daycare centers throughout the 1980s. The belief that daycare owners across the country were visiting dark occult acts of child abuse upon their young charges was the most prominent part of a broader daycare sex abuse mass panic, which in itself was part of the 1980s much broader wave of fear. Prior to the late 1970s, there was not that much that law enforcement had done to prosecute the sexual abuse of children. However, in the 1980s, the Department of Justice kind of revamped and retooled many laws, and there was a lot more focus on trying to protect these innocent victims. So all these allegations of ritual abuse in daycare centers came from the combination of legitimate awareness of a previously hidden problem and completely unfounded hysteria. As Georgetown professor John Myers explained to PBS's Frontline, child sexual abuse was never completely ignored by the American legal, medical, and child protection systems. Nevertheless, until the late 1970s and early 1980s, CSA was largely a hidden phenomenon. At the time the daycare cases arose, society was just beginning to acknowledge and come to terms with sexual abuse of children. Thus, the daycare cases did not come to the surface all by themselves. Rather, the daycare cases were part of the broader societal awakening to CSA. The daycare cases captured our attention for several reasons. First, the children were very young and vulnerable. Second, some of the allegations were bizarre and fantastic. Third, some of the alleged offenses were unspeakably horrific. Fourth, with so many American children in daycare, many parents could relate to these cases. And finally, the interviewing in some of the large daycare cases was clearly defective. Connecting this back to Michelle Remembers, the book gave people a villain to look for outside of the family. Again, uh, from your wrong about, I'll link these episodes in the description below. One of the hosts, Sarah Marshall, said that what readers heard was, don't look in the mirror. The call is not coming from inside the house. The Satanists are the problem. In reality, we know that most of these cases are perpetrated by people inside the family, not strangers. However, that was an extremely hard reality to face. People were just starting to reckon with the fact that this abuse occurred in a much more widespread fashion than was previously believed. And accepting the fact of the abuse was a bit easier if it was pinned on someone else. The earliest wave of satanic ritual abuse cases started in Kern County in California in 1980. In Bakersfield, social workers who had read Michelle Remembers learned of a clandestine local occult sex ring from two children who'd been coerced into fabricating the claims by a relative. Between 1984 and 1986, the investigation into these labyrinthine claims would send at least 26 people to jail in interrelated convictions, despite a complete lack of corroborative physical evidence for any of the claims. Nearly all of those convictions have since been overturned, including that of one man who served 20 years of a 40-year sentence, and those of two parents who were sentenced to 240 years in prison after their own sons were coached to accuse them of abuse. This template of a spiraling investigation, wild claims, and no evidence would continue well past the decade was over. Among them was the disastrous McMartin trial, which became the largest, longest, and most expensive trial in California history, and I believe remains so to this day. In 1983, one parent accused one of the staff members of the McMartin Preschool in Manhattan Beach, California of abuse. During the investigation, police allowed an unlicensed psychotherapist named Key McFarlane to conduct examinations of 400 children who attended the daycare. 
McFarlane famously used anatomically correct dolls and coercive interview processes, resulting in a staggering 321 counts of child abuse being leveled against seven daycare staff members by 41 children. The eyebrow-raising claims included allegations that daycare owners had built secret underground tunnels that led to ritual ceremonies, had ritually sacrificed a baby, flushed children down toilets, and could turn into witches and fly. Seems credible to me. Oh yeah, and people actually went around the school and like dug for the tunnels and couldn't find them. In 1986, Peggy McMartin Buckley, her son Raymond, and daughter Peggy Ann, and her mother, Virginia McMartin, were charged with 135 counts of molesting 14 children. Raymond served five years and Peggy served two before the case collapsed from a lack of corroborating evidence and their sentences were overturned. The case, which ultimately spanned two trials, lasted eight years and cost Los Angeles County more than $15 million, made it one of the most expensive criminal cases in American legal history. One by one, all charges against the daycare staffers were dropped, and the McMartin Preschool Building was raised in 1990. There was another case in Austin, Texas, that also focused on a daycare center. Dan and Frances Keller, who ran a daycare center from their Oak Hill home in Austin, were sentenced to 48 years in prison in 1992. The charges were that the couple had dismembered infants, abused the children in their care, even using those children to carry the bones of corpses exhumed from a local cemetery and making the children drink Kool-Aid mixed with human blood. This conviction for crimes they did not commit was based wholesale on the fantastical testimony of coerced children and tenuous circumstantial physical evidence provided by a Dr. Michael Mouau, an emergency room physician who treated one of the girls the Kellers were alleged to have abused. Mouau later recanted his testimony and the Kellers were finally released in 2013, having served more than 20 years of their sentences. These are only a few of the now ridiculous seeming cases that popped up in the United States and Canada during the time, and not everyone has even been released from prison over charges that could never ultimately be proven. The evidence wasn't there, but the allegations of satanic ritual abuse never really went away, said Ken Lanning, a former FBI agent who worked on hundreds of abuse cases with the Bureau's Behavioral Science Unit. When people get emotionally involved in an issue, common sense and reason go out the window. People believe what they want and need to believe. I think another real tragedy of this era, too, is that we do know that real abuses of children happen, and looking at this kind of red herring of satanic ritual abuse distracts from that real problem. The media, too, played a huge role in stoking public fear and kind of spreading misinformation in this time. A 1991-2020 episode famously, and for many viewers terrifyingly, aired an official Roman Catholic exorcism. In May of 1985, 2020 also ran a segment on Satan worship that described animal mutilations clearly used in some kind of bizarre ritual, rock music associated with devil worship, satanic graffiti, and backwards messages in pop songs. There were at least a few caveats to this broadcast. Host Hugh Downs opened by saying, Police have been skeptical when investigating these acts, just as we are in reporting them, but there is no question that something is going on out there, and that's sufficient reason for 2020 to look into it. In 1988, Geraldo Rivera's lurid documentary Devil Worship, exposing Satan's underground, became the highest rated televised documentary to air up until that point. Evangelical documentaries like Hell's Bells attempted to tie rock music to the occult, while Christian fantasy like that of best-selling author Frank Peretti transformed real-world social issues into matters of angelic and demonic warfare. In April of 1985, thousands of curious, angry, and confused customers were calling the corporate giant Procter & Gamble about leaflets that accused it of using its profits from household goods to support devil worship. They are simply not true, W. Wallace Abbott, a senior vice president, said at a news conference. We haven't the vaguest idea how it started. All we know is people are believing it. Do you know how hard it is to fight a rumor? False rumors had started years earlier, essentially tying the Procter & Gamble logo to supposed satanic or occult things. The logo was a bearded man in the moon facing 13 stars. People claimed this was actually a symbol of the devil. Uh, the logo dated to 1882 and the stars referred to the 13 original colonies. The company began a two-decade campaign to defend its name, sending representatives to churches, filing lawsuits, and pursuing court cases as recently as 2007. It also changed its logo. 
And speaking of things running into the 2000s, some of these fears never really went away. They just morphed into other concerns or kind of went off into the mainstream and started running around conspiracy circles. I mean, think of hashtag save the children or people in QAnon believing that there's child sex abuse from high-ranking Democrats and other powerful people. A lot of this stuff kind of has a direct link back to the satanic panic, and in a way, there have been moral panics all throughout human history. I think the satanic panic just happened to be so kind of special and unique because it was so widespread. It was everywhere in the media, it touched many different areas of life, and the effects with so many people going to prison were far-reaching. As I mentioned, there were a bunch of different things I touched on in this video, so I'm going to do a couple follow-up videos talking about some aspects of this. So stay tuned for those and let me know what you think of this video in the comments below. Let me know if you have any questions or experience with this time period. And also if you have any other video topics or suggestions you would like me to cover, leave that in the comments as well. As always, like this video if you liked it, and if you haven't and would like more videos like this, subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, have a great day, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!